just want to thank everybody for popping in to Supermove's second installment of Finance 101 for Movers. And um, a couple of things that we're going to be covering today, which is really, really exciting, is so one, we're going to be going over kind of the key to measuring profitability for your moving business. And some of the pieces that we're going to cover today are understanding the three ratios that measure the profitability of your business, understanding the difference between direct and indirect expenses, as well as discussing five proven ways to increase your profitability. And then we're also going to, at the end here, discuss how you can utilize Supermove to track your margins. So I'll get right into it here and uh, kind of introduce today's panelists. So obviously, I'm Ryan Marsh with Supermove on the partnerships and alliances side. We also have Supermove's very own product manager, Foster Kwan, on hand. And then our main speaker, Tracy Back. So Tracy, for everybody, if they don't know who she is, she's a serial entrepreneur. Entrepreneur, I'm having a hard time speaking here, but having started, ran, and sold two successful businesses, she is passionate about lowering the business failure rate by educating business owners and leaders about best practices and business strategy. She is also the CEO of Starboard Collectives, where she facilitates groups of CEOs in niche industries. And these groups share financial analysis, best practices, and focus on business development. Tracy is also a nationally recognized speaker on the topic of small business finance and also conducts a woman in business group in Hood River, Oregon, where she calls home. When she's not analyzing business ratios, Tracy is likely found on or near the water, dirt or snow, enjoying the great outdoors on boats, bikes, or skis. And if that's not enough, Tracy, this is awesome. You're also the co-author and advisor, 60 Minute CFO. It's super awesome to have you here and welcome aboard. Oh, thank you for having me. I'm so happy to be here. Thanks, Ryan. All right. Um, well, that was an awesome introduction. I thank you so much. Uh, and Ryan, can I, should I take it away from here? Yeah, take it away, share your screen and uh, let's get it moving here. Okay, great. I'm going to go ahead and share this screen. One second here. Here we go. Okay. Uh, Ryan, can you give me a thumbs up if you see my title slide, the key to measuring profitability? Okay, great. Thank you. Um, all right, I am so excited to be here with uh, Movers and with Supermove. I really love working with Movers. I have done a lot of work with Movers and I love the Supermove product. And so Ryan gave me an introduction. Um, I am a, a multi-passionate and a serial entrepreneur. I've started, run and exited two businesses of my own. I want to just set the stage here, though, and let everyone on this call know that I have learned most of the things that I'm going to talk about today the quote unquote hard way. And I do not come from a finance background. I did not major in this in college. And I got into business because I had a skill that I was good at. Okay. And then I had to bring on all of my financial acumen while my sleeves were rolled up and while I was in the trenches, as most business owners do. So if that is you and you didn't get your BA and your MBA in finance, you're in exactly the right spot. And we're going to talk about things in clear and simple English. And I want to make sure that if I do say anything in too much of finance speak that you stop me and you ask me a question about it, because that is not what we're here to do to speak in, in pure finance terms. We're here to talk about it in ways that make sense to our, us and our businesses. And um, as Ryan said, I do currently run two separate businesses. Both of them are based on teaching financial fluency for business owners and leaders. And that's through 60 Minutes CFO, which is a book, it's an online course and consultancy, and through Starboard Collectives, where we have multiple groups of movers. Actually, it's a financial focus group and we share best practices, business development, and all kinds of good things about being in business together. So what we're gonna talk about today, as Ryan mentioned, we are going to talk through the three ratios that measure the profitability of your business. Profits are the business owner's best friend, right? Every single person on this call has heard of that finance term, but hopefully what I'm going to help you take away from this is a little bit more granularity and detail here so that you can be more profitable. 
And I know that you are taking away from your busy day to day. It is peak season and we don't have a lot of time to work on our businesses at this time of year. We're mostly working in our business. So I will be direct and to the point. So hopefully my goal is you hang up from this webinar and have some things that you can go do today, tomorrow, this week that will help increase your profitability, okay? So in order to do that, we're also going to understand the difference between direct and indirect expenses. And this can be kind of a good, solid, healthy debate, but we'll talk through it and why it matters. We'll talk through five proven ways to increase your profitability. And for you guys, I have a bonus way as well as maybe one other bonus. So we might even hit seven ways to increase your profitability. And then we're gonna actually talk about the tools for calculating your margins. And we have tools that are within Supermove and tools that are adjacent to Supermove, but we're gonna give you those tools. We're gonna to talk about how you do this. Uh, the fine print that I always bring up is when we are in a group setting and to comply with FTC regulations, I am not going to be talking about any specific rates. Um, we're just gonna be talking about ratios and key metrics for profitability, okay? So that is out of the way. All right, so here's the situation that we are faced with. And I, as somebody who teaches this and works with this on a regular basis, get to see a lot of financial statements. And a recent one that I looked at in Excel had six tabs and I didn't count, but it probably had at least 15,000 numbers on it. And as business owners, we do have a tendency to do this. We pull a report and we look at it. And we have this tendency to only look at the numbers. But the problem is that the message is hidden in the numbers. And so if we're just looking at numbers, we might be missing the actual story that our numbers are trying to tell us. And what we need to do is we need to look at the relationship between numbers. So we can't just look at one in isolation. We have to look at it in relationship to something else. And here's an example of what I mean. So let's say I have, if I tell you I have a net profit, all the money I took home at the end of the day was $5 million. And if I didn't tell you anything else and those two bullet points below this question weren't there, could you definitively tell me if that was good or bad? And your tendency, your temptation is to say, heck yeah, that is good. You have $5 million in profit. You knocked it out of the park. You did a great job. But what if I told you my revenue was $5 billion? Now we're almost breaking even. That's a 0.1% profit. When we're dealing with $5 billion in revenue and all I net at the end of the day is $5 million, we might not be doing economically so well here, right? 0.1% is not usually what gets us out of, the bed, of our bed in the morning to go make money. So the, 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 this is one of the most basic examples of why we need to look at our profit in relationship to something else. And in this case, and in this webinar, we're going to be talking about looking at our profits in relationship to our revenue. Okay, we're gonna anchor it in the revenue that we bring in and we're gonna talk about what was that relationship, but we're gonna also do a little bit more detail. Okay, so the income statement. Now, profits live on our income statement. There are three financial statements. We have our income statement, we have our balance sheet, and we have our cash flow statement. If I, I like to say, uh, liken them to celebrities. And if we could say which celebrity the income statement would be, we would call it the Beyonce of our income statements, okay? Everyone knows it and everyone loves it because this is where our revenue is and this is where our profit is. So she, this is the sparkly popular income statement. So I'm willing to bet that everyone on the call has seen theirs, okay? We spend a lot of time here. It's where our revenue is, it's where our profit is. But here's the deal. In between the top line and the bottom line, so the revenue is our top line and the bottom line is our net profit, there are more ratios to look at. And those are often overlooked. The three are gross profit margin, operating profit margin, and net profit margin. And we're going to have a pop quiz. And so in the chat, if you are multitasking, come back to me real quick and come into the chat 
And just tell me, which is the most important you think to track for optimizing your profitability? Is it A, gross profit margin? Is it B, operating profit margin? Or is it C, net profit margin? If we want to be the most profitable in business, where should we, where should we spend our time tracking? And don't be shy. Yeah, chat is up and running. Let's see the answers. We've got our first one. Okay, Peggy says B, operating profit margin. Uh, somebody says uh, operating profit margin. Okay, we got Robert with operating profit margin. Uh, we have another operating profit margin. Okay, so it seems to me we are voting that B, operating profit margin is likely. And no, we have no votes for net and we have no votes for gross. Okay, well, let's find out the answer. I'm sorry to say that our class has not uh, selected the most important margin to track. And this is what the um, kind of exciting news is. <laughs> We are overlooking the most important margin to track, which is gross profit margin. And I am going to spend some time convincing you why this is the case. Also, if you are already panicking because you know for certain that you are not even tracking gross profit margin, then you are also in the right place. That is okay. You are, you are, not, um, you are not lost. This is not a lost cause. We can make this right. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is show you a picture of your income statement, okay? So normally we look at this in Excel or kind of like a tabular-based setting. This is a picture of your income statement. And on the left, we have all of the money that you bill and bring in, okay? And that is our revenue. The first level of profitability, we take out all of our direct expenses and what we are left with is our gross profit. So direct expenses, let's just take a minute and I will talk a little more, bit more in detail about this, are the expenses that you must spend in order to produce revenue. So for example, truck expenses are direct expenses because you cannot perform a move without driving the truck, right? Uh, uh, Boxes are direct expenses because you cannot load a box without having the box, right? W direct wages for movers who show up, for drivers who show up to perform the move are direct expenses because we cannot make that money without spending that money. And in other words, if we have more work, we have to spend more on those expenses, right? And when we have fewer moves, those expenses would then also go down. So direct expenses are tied to revenue producing activity. When we are done with spending money on our direct expenses, what we have left over is our gross profit. And from that, we take out our indirect expenses. And those are things that are not tied to doing moves. In other words, our office manager, paying our CPA, paying for our insurance, any travel and entertainment, our advertising fees, our administrative wages, our paper clips, our, you know, our copier ink, those types of things that even if we did 10 moves or one move would pretty much be the same. We don't have to go drastically up or down. Now, if you went from $1 million in revenue to $10 million in revenue, you'd probably start to stair step up some of these expenses over time. You might add another office manager or something like that, a few more desks, but it's not, it's not directly tied to one move, right? It's just a, it's just kind of an aggregate amount of things that we use to support an over an overarching book of business. And after we are done paying for those things, we are left with our operating profit. And then you can see that from our operating profit, we pull out other income and other expense. Some, I mean, sometimes we add a little bit in here. If we sell an asset, that would come in as other income. It wasn't like normal day-to-day -day 
revenue that we, you know, our business um, books, but it is um, other income and then other expense, which is very nebulous. But again, you know, if you had just something that doesn't have to do with the operations of your business, that would come in here. And that is then what we are left with is our net profit. And if we want to make these into ratios, we simply divide them by revenue. So our gross profit margin is gross profit divided by revenue. And this, as I said in the quiz, is where we focus. And I will tell you why. I want you to track yours down to a tenth of a percent. And because I will show you, if it goes down, your net profit will go down. And here is why. This is also a waterfall. And you can see that if I increase my gross profit and my direct expenses stay the same, I will, I will have more operating profit. And then that will trickle down into my net profit. And if we focus at the top of the waterfall, we have way more opportunity to optimize our net profit. So when we don't focus on the top, we can only affect what's there or below. So imagine if we were only focusing on net. We have to guess, we have to look at everything upstream and kind of like sh do a shotgun approach at, at optimizing profits and then hope it's gonna end in the net profit. If we only focus on operating profit, we still, while we could probably increase our profitability, are ignoring everything upstream. But when we start here, we start with all of the opportunity, right? And in fact, you can imagine that if this gross, if this profit margin isn't optimized, a lot of times what we try to do is make more money. Okay, we're down, we need more money, let's sell more jobs. But what happens if we're selling jobs at not a high enough gross profit margin? If we are selling jobs at too low of a gross profit margin, will we ever really get ahead and make more money? No, we will work really hard though. <laughs> and we will be very tired, but we will not necessarily have any more profits to show. And in fact, sometimes people get upside down on this, right? And the more we work, the more we spend and we have less and less and less money because we aren't paying attention to the driver that is in control here. This gross profit margin is the first, it, I like to call it the battle we must win in order to win the war, right? This is the first line of defense on our profitability. <clears throat> Sales commissions, are they direct or indirect? I see Charles has a question here. Sales commissions are, well, let, let's go into, uh, let, me save the, let me save the answer to that question because we're going to talk about a few more things with regards to expenses. So I will come back to that, but I've got that on my radar. <clears throat> okay, so <clears throat> hopefully I have made a little bit of a case for why we want to track gross profit margin. Here are a list. This is my list of direct expenses. <laughs> Now you can we can debate and we can make cases for things to be direct or indirect. <clears throat> These are my suggestions, and I will give you the um, reasoning behind it. Ultimately, what I want you to do as an action item for your business as a result of this conversation is make sure that you have chosen some expenses as your direct expenses. And over time, if you realize some more need to be added or some need to be removed, that's okay. But the opportunity here is to have a conversation with your bookkeeper and say, hey, we need to move some of these up into our, in, into our direct expenses, okay? So direct wages, that would be salaries, wages, bonuses paid to any operations or production person, including branch managers, operation managers, and dispatch, direct wages. Owner operator expense, if you have contractors, those fees that you pay to them are direct expenses. Packing and warehouse materials, you've got to have those in order to do the move. They are direct expenses. Claims come as a direct result of doing moves, right? We don't have claims and we don't do moves. Those are direct expenses. The rent and lease of operating equipment. We need more operating equipment. We rent more, we lease more. Those are direct expenses that go towards our move. 
via other vehicle operating expenses, repairs, maintenance, fuel, license, registration, tires, tubes, permits, all of the things listed here are part of our direct expenses. And yes, Kirk, COGS. This is also why a lot of movers don't have it. Direct expenses in other lines of work are called costs of goods sold, right? And a lot of times we think that because we're in the service business as movers, that we don't have that because we don't sell any goods. We sell a service. But it's it's deceiving because we do still have direct expenses. And so we still can track that. We still have expenses that are part of the goods or services that we sell. Okay. So yes, in your mind, if you know what COGS is, that's a great way to think of your direct expenses. <clears throat> Other transportation expenses, right? So like deadhead miles, agent fees, um, owner operator, physical damage insurance, things like that. And then there's always going to be another category, right? Where we can put the rest of our <clears throat> items, parking tickets, delivery service, tolls, laundry. Okay. Um, so the question was, are sales commissions direct or indirect? Do you need to have a salesperson in order to do a move? Kind of, sort of, but not really, right? Do they go out and perform the service? Kind of, they get the, they get the move, but they don't necessarily perform the move. Um, we could probably argue one way or the other. I personally put them in indirect expenses, which we're getting to, but you, what I want you to do is make that determination in your mind. And I'm going to show you what the uh, result is of having um, maybe weighted towards more direct versus more indirect expenses. You can kind of see what that does to how you're tracking your profitability um, and make that determination on your own. But let me show you what we are aiming for. So again, gross profit margin, very important. In the moving industry, with the companies that I have worked with and seen data for, I see a range between 25 to 45%, right? So that's taking everything that you make after direct expense and dividing it into your revenue. That's how we got 25 to 45%. Now, what if yours is 20%? We'll talk about that, right? What if you want yours to be 45% and yours is 25%? We'll talk about that because we do know that in the moving industry, it's possible to have up to 45% of a gross profit margin. So let's, let's explore that a little bit later as well. But <clears throat> part of this exercise is to, the first step is to know what yours is, right? It's very hard to increase it if we don't know what it is. Okay, so now let's talk about operating profit margin. Uh, as I said, these are the indirect expenses. We could think of them as overhead. Um, so uh, that is going to be, I'm just looking at Kirk. You actually came back to and, and asked a question about sales commission. Oh, sorry. Okay, Kirk, good. I'm glad I got your question. Um, I want you to think of this as overhead, right? And I do typically put salespeople into this category just to kind of follow up on Kirk's question um, because I don't necessarily need them in order to do the move. Um, other people I think would argue with me on that and say, no, I really do consider that a part of my flywheel and I can't do my business without them. Whatever it is you wanna do, put them where, you, where it philosophically aligns for you and then keep it there, okay? And then we're gonna track based on that. Again, operating profit margin is we're taking what we have left after we've spent all of our direct expenses and we have left over our operating profit and we divide it into revenue. I want you to track this as well. So I told you gross profit margin was the most important. It doesn't mean I want you to ignore the other levels. The interesting opportunity that we have here, especially because I'm telling you to track this on a tenth of a percent basis, is because we have a lot of things in this category. This is what you're probably really used to looking in a chart of accounts. There's so many things that we have that we track in our businesses, right? And honestly, truthfully, most of them really are overhead expenses, right? And, and when you do your, your, your exercise and move things up, you're going to move a few things, but you're going to leave most things in operating expenses or overhead. 
So imagine, how many things do I have listed here? I have at least what, 15 or 20. Imagine if you went through and try to shave a 10th of a percent off of each one of these things. A 10th of a percent 10 times is 1%, right? 1% 10 times is 10%. And who here would like to see 10% more in their bottom line? Like I said, it, it will trickle down, right? If you save 10% on this level, and we have a lot of opportunity here, we say 1% 10 times, we will get a 10% increase in our net profit. That's huge. That is huge because we know that I recently heard somebody say in the moving industry, we're trying to make money between the wall and the wallpaper, right? We don't have a high margin industry here. And so the, there are so many opportunities here. Um, and imagine if you saved 1% on your gross profit margin, right? Then you have that one's going to go directly to your bottom line. Ryan, you unmuted. Do you have something to add there? No, I just I just kind of listen to you following here. It's it, kind of what I'm ca catching is it, it's not necessarily the mass big expense. It's just little smidgens of expenses across the board that we often overlook and oversee that can really truly add up to again that that ten percent. That's kind of that's that's what I'm taking from. Is that kind of where you're you're going along with that? That's totally right. And it's just it's and the other key piece here is it is so overwhelming to do if we don't start putting our if we don't start categorizing our expenses. Because I do want you to remember that I said direct expenses go up. They go up when we make more money. So if we're trying to out earn and outwork our profit, our low profitability problem, we won't ever do it unless we make sure that our direct expenses are between that 25 and 45 percent. It means we're losing money on that first battle and we won't win the war and we'll be very tired and burnt out. <laughs> by trying to solve it that way. Okay, so I want to do one more exercise if we're not sure. Okay, one, another question I get, and I, I bet it's probably on the tip of somebody's tongue here and they just haven't asked it yet, is, is warehouse rent a direct expense? That is a good solid debate, right? Because can we have storage revenue if we don't have a warehouse? That's a common, common, Question that I get asked. I don't know, Ryan, what do you think? Yeah, I'm going to let, uh, hopefully people chime in and answer here. I'm, I'm really excited to hear what this one is. I don't want to say anything yet. I want to say, oh, I'm not even going to say it yet. We'll wait to, to hear what everybody else says. Yeah. I'm wondering if people are able to chat properly here. Um, if warehouse rent, let's just, let's just model this out. Okay. If your storage revenue goes away, do you still have to pay your rent? If everyone moved out of your warehouse, what happens to your rent? Well, it stays, right? So actually, I think I wrote this question wrong. If no, it's a direct expense. If, if, if no, it's a direct expense. Sorry, cross this out. It's a direct expense. If you don't have to pay your rent next month because there's nobody in your warehouse, then that is tied to your revenue. And then if someone moves into your warehouse and you have revenue, and then you only have to pay rent when there's somebody in the warehouse, then that's a direct expense because it went up and down with your revenue. Now, if, so then I have people who say, well, if I get more, more storage, I need to get more warehouse. And so that, rev so that expense goes up when I get more revenue. And I would argue, if we are heavily based, you know, if our revenue is heavily based in storage, we can go through and actually um, allocate the percentage of rent that is rented to direct expense and we could break it up, right? But the, the key principles to 60 Minute CFO and to everything that I teach, first and foremost, is always to keep it simple. So I never advocate for that as a first approach. And to be the most um, conservative here, we would want to just categorize it as an indirect expense. And that I'll show you why that is a little bit more conservative to do. Okay. Because when we categorize things as direct expenses, we're saying that um, we, we have less risk. And, I'll, and again, I have a, a, a way to show that. Um, I'm just reading a question from Bo. What ratio of time?
Oh, okay. Um, is it easier to save a dollar or make a dollar in your opinion? Uh, uh, that is a super good question. Let me just think about this for a minute. The first thing that I would do is understand my expenses. The very first thing I would do, because I want to make sure that every single effort that my team, my company is doing is optimized properly. And I want to build any further revenue on that model. So I think it is easier and more efficient to work on saving a dollar before you start chasing more dollars. Once you've done the saving piece, move on to the making piece. That's my answer for Bo. And I, I like love that. Great question. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. The goal here, I wanted to make sure everyone walks away with some ben benchmarks in the moving industry. On very broad terms, most of the time, successful business uh, moving companies have an operating profit margin of about 8%. Okay, 8%. So again, if you're looking at yours and it is not 8%, what do we do? I would say, Bo, it, that, that, that opportunity there is to go through and shave 1% off of 10 things and see if you can't make 10%, right? Uh, it's an opportunity. If you're, at, if you're negative, that's probably where a lot of the, the work will lie, right? Is small changes over many different categories um, to get us to the 8%. But again, if we're not already at the 25 to 45 here, this is where we need to focus. Okay, 25 to 45% is our target for gross profit margin. 8% is our target for operating profit margin. And net, net profit margin. So. I want to really applaud everybody because I don't think anybody in my quiz said that this was the most important ratio, even though I know you were probably tempted to, and that's okay, uh, because so many people, so many companies that I work with in and out of the moving company uh, industry only focus on net profit. But you can see now, hopefully, why this one hardly matters, right? Because by the time you have done all of your work, optimizing your gross profit, optimizing your operating profit, the only things that come in here are those other categories, right? And those things are largely to do with not operating our business, right? So we get like interest income here and we get interest expense here. And we can, we can manipulate this as we want to because of Uncle Sam and how much we want to pay in taxes. So it really almost is meaningless once we get down to this level. And if we've hit our benchmarks for gross and operating profit margins, by the time we get to net, eh, it's kind of whatever we want it to be, right? So I very rarely focus in on this. And of course we you know, don't want it to be negative, but then again, a lot of times it is for other reasons. And again, so I, I don't focus on this and I hope that you guys can see based on what we talked about why. Um, so again, here are the things that come in here. Like I said, other income, other expense and interest expense, all very, very, uh, you know, fairly inconsequential when it comes to the day-to-day -day running of your business. Okay, so uh, let's talk about um, the benchmark for this. I would say about 6%, but again, it is highly, highly manipulatable. So again, it is usually, I will say, in the single digits for moving companies. And I would argue that because of that, it's even more important to focus on the upstream effects so that we can make sure that this doesn't go to zero. It's, it's, there's a lot of opportunity upstream here. So let's take ourselves through a little bit of a exercise. If we want to increase our bottom line, I just wanted to kind of illustrate for you, if you took the approach from the top down, what you can see here is an increase from 37% of a gross profit margin to 38% without changing anything else in your business. If you save 1% in costs and increase your margin by 1%, at the top at gross profit margin level from 37 to 38, that 1% just follows down. 
So without changing anything in your operating expenses, your operating profit margin went from five to 6% and your net profit margin went from four to 5%. And that's because you only did one, one change of 1% at the top. And that is a change that will, you know, spread itself through every job that you do in the company because that those are gross profit margins. Those are directly tied to, to revenue producing. And the difference between 4% and 5% is actually a 20% increase in net profit. So just because we're talking about 1% here and there doesn't mean it actually doesn't equate to something large in terms of your dollars. And again, I think answering that question, is it better to chase a dollar saved or a dollar earned? If we can chase making sure our margins are correct, we can actually affect quite a few dollars in the bottom line if we do it at the, at the right level, right? Uh, so anyway, this, this is meant to say that small differences at the top can make a big difference at the bottom line. And I just want to motivate you a little bit. So again, if you're somebody who has only top line and bottom line revenue, the exercise is to go in and do some classification of your expenses. Are they direct or are they indirect? And that is a bookkeeping task. This is a bookkeeping task. And you could even sit with your bookkeeper next to your accounting software and, and go through your chart of accounts and have them classify them as cost of goods or operating expense, okay? And they can do that. That's just a, that's just a toggle on your chart of accounts. And then when you run your income statement, you're gonna start to see these metrics, okay? You're gonna see the three levels. Okay, now I'm gonna, now I'm gonna transition into just understanding break even. And the reason, that I put this in a profitability talk is that obviously we wanna do better than break even, right? But break even also starts to talk about not just how we classify expenses, but how your expenses behave. So until now, um, I've been saying, is it directly tied to making money or is it not, right? So here is one more way to think about it. We've got direct and indirect, which is what we just talked about, and we also have fixed and variable. And then sometimes there's a third, which is both. So when we can decide how our expenses behave, that's the fixed or the variable piece. We can then understand how, where, what's happening to our break-even point and how, if, if our break-even point is getting higher or getting lower. Okay, and again, I'm not trying to teach us how to break even. I want us to be profitable, <laughs> but we have to at least break even to be profitable. And it does have a little bit to do with this fixed variable and both. So for example, a fixed expense is something that is the same every month because you can decide what you want it to be. So let's use rent as an example. Rent, fairly fixed, right? Like you're, you're, you pay your rent every single month. Whatever that bill is, it comes in. It's not going up when you make more money and it's not going down when you make less money. It just is your rent. Okay. Insurance. Insurance is typically fixed, right? You get your rates for the year and whether you're making a ton of money, you're making not a lot of money, you still have to pay that insurance bill. The insurance bill just comes. Okay. Here's another tricky one. Marketing. Okay. Marketing. Marketing is a fixed expense. Now I know you're probably thinking, no, it's not like I can decide what I want it to be, but that's just it. And you might decide for it to be lower. You might decide for it to be higher. So you're thinking that's a variable expense. That's not what variable means in this case, because you're deciding to fix it at $3,000 for this month. And next month you're deciding to fix it at $5,000. If it's variable, it will go from three to five, whether you want it to or not based on what your revenue did. So it's not varying with respects to your revenue, it's fixed based on what you want it to be, okay? But a variable expense is indeed how much you pay a mover. An hourly mover is a variable expense. They work 10 hours, you pay them $10 per hour, you know, times 10. They work one hour, you pay them for one hour. That is varying with respects to the revenue that they're bringing in. That's a variable expense. Revenue goes up, their expenses go up. Revenue goes down, their 
uh, expenses go down. And those two things are, are moving like this together, okay? So let's just look at my little example here. This is a little bit more financy than I want it to be, but um, <laughs> I just wanna show this. And, and if this is making your eyes glaze over, um, that's okay. This isn't gonna be the key takeaway that you, you have. But what I just want to show you is that the reason it matters is if we have really a lot of high fixed expenses and our, we have low variable expenses, we're gonna have a higher break-even point. So if we want a lower break-even point, what we're gonna do is we're going to lower our fixed expenses and try to make other expenses variable. And that kind of makes intuitive sense, right? Like let's just get a really cheap office space. Let's decrease some of these overhead bills and make it easier for us to break even every month. And then that way we're only paying, you know, paying money when we're making money. Higher variable expenses, right? So it's okay because we're still gonna manage that profit margin, but we've lowered that overall, you know, barrier to entry just for breaking even every month. So as you're going through thinking about how to be profitable, I want you to think about if you're having profitability issues, what can we change from a fixed expense to a variable expense? Because that's going to change how, how much money we have to make just in order to break even every month. Okay. And so the goal here is to look at break even on a monthly basis. It's to look at it on a yearly basis and how we can make fixed expenses variable if we need to lower our break-even uh, level. Okay, all right, I have a few things more to get through and then I wanna save time for questions. So now we're gonna talk about how you can achieve good profits, okay? Some of these things are <clears throat> examples of things we've seen people not do. And so in other words, we do need to do these in order to be profitable, but we don't wanna put things off. We need to act promptly. So the <clears throat> tendency is to think things are gonna get better we just need to work harder and increase revenue. And we can't lay anybody off um, because we've worked so hard to find these good employees. So we just have to retain everybody. And what we do is we kick the can down the road and we bleed money for longer than we need to. And we don't cut expenses right away. So this is your call to action to cut expenses right away when you see you need to do it. The second is ask for help. This isn't a one person activity and it can be a team effort. So involve your leadership team, ask where people think you can save money, where can we ch change a fixed expense to a variable? Uh, what can we cut? Let's go through every single thing. You know, if it's a, like I told you, if we save 1.1% on 10 things, where can it be? People have great ideas. Which leads me to number three, is carefully audit all of our indirect expenses. And that can often save you 10%. You guys have already heard me say that. This is a touchy subject, number four, especially because we just went through, we have been going through a really, really tight labor market, but we do need to always audit all employee positions. We need to revisit, is this a full-time position? Could it be combined with another position? Let's make sure we do not have excess staff. And there is a metric, and it's not necessarily what we're talking about today, but we can track our revenue per admin employee simply by knowing our revenue and the number of admin employees to kind of help us gauge if we're overstaffed or understaffed. For the moving industry, I see that between $450,000 and $650,000 a year. So you just take your revenue, divide it by how many number of employees you have who are non-revenue producing. We need to track this. And number five is thinking strategically to avoid our seasonal losses. So it's, it's peak season and, and this is not our problem right now. <clears throat> we have May, June, and July where we are very profitable, but what about the rest of the year? And I see so many companies now doing inc incredible things to diversify so that we can see profitability all year round. It really helps even out this swing. So we don't have to make all of our, all of our hay in the summer while the sun is shining. And number six is my bonus tip. And I bring it up because the last three years have been something else. So for many, many movers, 2021 was a real special year. 
and they had more work th than they could ever, ever do, right? So the demand far outpaced the supply. And in that scenario, many movers were able to really increase pricing, right? And that's one that we don't get to talk about every year, but I do like to remind us that it is an opportunity when we see it, we can take it, right? It's not always about cutting costs or doing more work. Sometimes you could just charge more for the work you're doing. <laughs> so you can raise your prices, easy. right, Tracy? That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So don't forget about that one mm -hmm. when, when the opportunity arises. Okay. So how do we do this? I told you I wanted to give you some tools. So on 60minutescfo.com, if you go to resources, there is a place to download some spreadsheets. The spreadsheets do the math for you. And you can also easily do this math alongside your own income statement. But here's a, just a screenshot of what it looks like. You enter in your balance sheet, you enter in your income statement, and what this uh, will tell you is your gross profit, 57%. It will tell you your operating profit, 4.3%. And it will tell you your net profit, 2.4%. Okay. So if you are excited, you can easily download this. It's called Business Mastery. And it will also, and it's not the topic of our talk today, it will also do a cash flow statement for you. And it will also calculate a few other ratios that we talk about in the 60 minute CFO book so that you can you can gauge a few other metrics for your business but topic for another another webinar um if you do your first pass at your income statement and your gross profit margin is not between 25 and 45 percent I have a little bit more work for you to do and I'm also going to have Foster talk about this a little bit um we need to go in a little bit more detail, okay? Because the other key component here is how much are we making per job, right? It's the sum total of all of the jobs that we do is the gross profit margin, but which jobs are more profitable than others? And are we pricing them correctly? Because maybe we aren't, right? So we need to understand how much we need to make on a pack job or a move job. We need to know what our costs are, and we want to be able to quote them so that we make between 25 and 45 percent or whatever it is our goal is. So also on 60minutecfo.com, you can download the job costing template. OK, I think Ryan's laughing because he's used this before in his previous lives, right, Ryan? I love it. I just in the name, the Chester drawer always got me. I love it. <laughs> on chicken dinner road. So uh, you can spend time here setting up what all of your costs are. It actually goes into the cost of running your trucks. You're going to see a fully loaded cost to do a job, pack job, load job, unload job, transportation. And you are going to be able to see what the desired gross profit margin is and what you are actually taking home. And if there's an under or an overage, okay? Do you have to do it for every job? No, not necessarily. But I recommend as a start that you go back in time and audit a few jobs, maybe some of the bigger ones, maybe some of the smaller ones. You probably know in the back of your mind, like, how did we do on Mrs. Jones's? Mm, you know, like, let's, let's double check. I think we gave her a discount and it took twice as long. Like, did we, what did we make or lose on that job? And we start to put the pieces together. Okay. There's also some screens in Supermove that you can see. I have a screenshot here of the cost and compensation screen that will also show you based on the employee costs, um, what your profit margin is on this job. So it's not necessarily fully loaded, but it is another really great place that you have transparency and you can see what, what the um, cost and compensation are per job um, outside of like truck costs and things like that. Foster or Ryan, did you wanna go in a little more detail here? Yeah, definitely. And if it's all right, I can even, uh, you know, share my screen and jump in yeah. a little bit of what that yeah. looks like in practice. Yeah. Thank you, Tracy. Awesome. Um, hey, everyone. So yeah, I can go ahead and jump into Supermove to see what that looks like, you know, on a living, breathing project. So the main two things I want to take away here, we're going to cover, yeah, how to use the, the cost and comp and as well as the billing sections on the Supermove project page to help you sort of 
start to craft and get a picture of what that looks like on that project or on that job level, right? Like Tracy said, it's the little pieces that sort of build up and add up. Um, so with the example that I have here, you know, we have our, our invoicing billing section where we go through, um, you know, the, the fees that you might charge, the, the quote that you might give that customer. This is just kind of monopoly money I'm throwing here, some play numbers. So, you know, obviously this is, uh, it'll vary depending on your circumstance, but, you know, let's say it's a $600 invoice or bill that we're working on. Um, when we look a little bit further down on the job page, we start to look at some of the cost of compensation. So in this case here, I have a few, you know, movers assigned to the job, a driver, and I'm also double dipping as both the salesperson, you know, moonlighting as well. So making some, uh, if some commission on that job as well. Um, when we start to break that down, we start to see, you know, we have the, the total revenue, right? What's, what's the, you know, the top line for that job, total costs, the profit and the percent. So I'm at 27%, just above that threshold that Tracy was talking about, you know, 25 to 45%. But when we start to drill into this, we start to paint a picture, right? So part of this exercise is really understanding what are those direct costs? Um, you know, what are those things that we need to be considering um, to, to, to turn a profit or to, to increase this profit here? So if I were to jump in, you know, one of the things that might not be considered right away is, you know, I think I saw it on the list as well, direct expenses, you know, the fuel as a charge, right? So as an example, I might say, you know what, we need to consider that for this job, I'm going to pay about a hundred bucks in gas, right? I don't know. I'm up in Canada. Gas is pretty expensive. I don't know how, how crazy it is down there uh, in the States, but let's assume, you know, I need to include gas. Well, look at this. Suddenly that profit's dipping pretty bad, right? We're down to the 10%. So what this gives you though, is it starts to paint a picture so that you can quickly calculate, okay, what sort of levers should I be pulling to help increase that profit? In, you know, compensation adjustments might not be the path to go, but when we go back up to the, the revenue side of things, well, you know what, and, and this goes, ties in really well to, to you know, Tracy's point, bonus point number six is let's start increasing some of these fees or at least start to understand, you know, what that means. You know, this general moving fee or administration fee, how does that tie into that, you know, 450, 650K margin that we're looking for, right? So we might want to increase the pricing here. We might want to add, you know, a fuel surcharge if we needed to. Just for, you know, argument's sake, I'll add, you know, $150 uh, fuel surcharge here. Um, and again, you can see in Supermove, the intent is to try to make this as easy as possible to update. And when we look at the numbers again, we're back at the 27, we can play with the rates, we can start increasing some, some of these things here to bring this up to a healthier profit. But even here, you can start to experiment and quickly see where those opportunities are to increase the overall profit and the margins for, you know, at this job level. And then the cool thing here is once you're satisfied with this, you can also create templates for this. So as you're creating new jobs, you already have those numbers, those rates already um, accounted for. Um, so that's the first piece on how we can help paint a better picture, help you capture at that more micro level, the different expenses and the different um, potential opportunities from the revenue side. And then the other pieces, you know, going back to that top dollar, you know, how are we tracking this information in the macro? How do we make this easier for accounting teams? Some of the recent updates that we've been launching is the whole concept of this invoicing, right? So once you've invoiced the customer and not only can you charge a credit card directly from Supermove, um, but you can also now export these invoices over to QuickBooks. So for those that have, you know, QuickBooks Online or QuickBooks Desktop now, you can export these invoices, start to track that revenue, plug that into the wonderful spreadsheets that, uh, that Trace is gonna provide and then help paint that full picture for you as to where you are. So again, part of the tooling that we have here to help round out that picture and ultimately help you increase your profits. That's it, thanks. I'll pass it back to, I guess, Tracy or, or Ryan. Sure. Good, thank you, Foster. Uh, awesome, yes. So uh, I just love the way that that provides accountability and keeps us on track. I mean, you have visibility right there in the moving, you know, template. You can you can remember to charge all of the charges, right? Like there's like a key a few key pieces in there just to make it a little bit more easy to do, right? Um, I'm gonna share my screen one more time because I just want to make sure. Um, okay, do you guys see my screenshot of costs and compensation? Yep. Okay, great. So I want to make sure that we leave with um, what we're gonna do with all of this information that we just acquired. So you do have a few things to do. If you haven't already, um, if it's not already like this in your uh, 
QuickBooks or whatever accounting software you're using is you're going to categorize your direct and indirect expenses. That's sitting down with your bookkeeper and moving some things around in your accounting system. Then you're going to learn what your current gross profit margin is, and you're going to decide on your desired gross profit margin if you don't like what it currently is. Okay. And we're going to remember that that's our most important ratio of all. Um, we're going to keep in mind some of the five proven ways to increase our profitability. Again, if we don't like what it is. And then you can go to 60 Minute CFO and download Business Mastery, download job costing as necessary if you want to use those tools to do your calculations. You're going to look at your cost and compensation screen in Supermove. And I think maybe, Ryan, you were directing people exactly how to get to that. Um, behind the scenes and, and Foster, you just showed everyone where that lives. And I also want to remind everybody that this is a skill. And remember, I, I, I gained these skills on the job, okay? And I didn't, I didn't go to school for this, but the way that you gain this skill is just like you do any other skill, it's with practice, okay? And it's, it's a muscle. And if you don't use it, you'll lose it. So we can't just look at this because you just came to this webinar and do it one time. We have to do it every month. And that's where the 60 minute CFO's name is from, is it she doesn't have to take you all day. You have other things to do, you're running a business, but you do need to set aside an hour, one month, an hour per month uh, to look at this stuff. And it really will make a difference. It really does make a difference. So, um, these are 60minutecfo.com is where you can get the book, the templates. There's an online course. There's also some online reporting coming. And I just want to make sure that everyone knows that this, just like it's a skill, it's a journey. It's not a destination. No one ever knows everything there is to know about business finance. You're just somewhere along the, the scale, the journey, right? And it changes as you're just as the economy changes, your business changes and your industry changes. So just drop anything that you may have already, you know, a preconceived notion about what this does or does not entail um, and, and start today. Today's the perfect day to start on tracking your profitability. So that's everything I have to say. Um, and I'll open up to questions. I know we have a couple minutes. Yeah, a couple minutes for questions as we get rolling. And again, thanks, Tracy, for kind of summarizing this and um, giving me an opportunity to plug the 60 minute CFO here. You kind of popped it right on here for me. So appreciate that as well. We have any uh, good time for maybe a potential question or two before uh, just want to try to respect everybody's time as well. The, somebody says, repeat again, the formula for non-revenue producing employees. So like, I, I mean, I'm taking this to mean the definition maybe of a non-revenue producing employee. Um, so non-revenue producing employees are people who, you know, who aren't movers, who are, you know, maybe considered overhead, right? So your office manager, your managers, your owners, if they don't go out on jobs, um, salespeople, I consider non-revenue. And um, what we do if for revenue per admin employee is we count up the number of non-revenue producing admin employees we have. And sometimes if I have someone who does half, um, you know, they do go out and like do work in the warehouse, but then they come back and do another role that's more overhead. I'll count them as a 0.5. You use a fraction. You take that number of people and you take your revenue. You take all of your revenue and divide it by the number of people. And I said that was supposed to be between $450,000 and $650,000. Your business might have a slightly more unique one. And the interesting thing about it is when you track that number over time, you're going to start to understand what your number should be because everyone has an internal gauge for are we understaffed or overstaffed? And you'll start to kind of remember like, yeah, we were super overstaffed in 2019. That number was 250,000. That's way too low. We need to increase it. But then it got to be 1.2 million and that felt horrible. We were way under, we were way understaffed. We think that, you know, 800,000 is our sweet spot. It's, got, it's going to range based on, you know, how your business operates but tracking it is the first step there. Um, Kirk says there are eight Excel sheets. Which one should we start with? Um, you wanna start with business mastery and it may also be called move mastery um, and job costing. And each of those have sample data. So you could get the one that's blank and the one that has sample. Those four would be kind of places to start. 
Excellent. Well, awesome. Just want to thank both of you, Foster. Again, Tracy, it's always a pleasure chatting with you. Great, great piece today. Hopefully everybody that's listening and watching here was able to grab some awesome nuggets um, from Tracy's deck here. But uh, obviously, we'll have this all emailed over to you here within a couple of days uh, after this. So feel free to share it with your teams and your network. And uh, again, thank you, Tracy. Thank you, Foster. And appreciate everybody for joining us today uh, for this webinar. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure being here. It was awesome. Thanks so much, Tracy. Take care, everyone. Bye, everyone.